These are four of the greatest gardens in Britain. Gravetime Manor, Ashwood, Great Dixter and Gresgarth Hall. Each has its own unique story to tell. It's like entering another world. Join me, Carol Klein, on a journey through the four seasons as I experience a year in their lives. I wish you could smell the perfume. Meet the people who look after them. It's a bit like falling in love. You can't actually... Help it. No. Joyous, isn't it? I think it's the best time of the year. Unearth the secrets of how they evolve. Chris has to be the bee. Do you have to say <laughs> bzzz while you're doing it? <laughs> Reflect on their magnificent designs and celebrate the plants that make each so special. Carefully colour coordinated. These borders are at their absolute zenith. These are great British gardens. I can't wait. Can you? This is Gresgarth Hall, near Morecambe in rural Lancashire. And its garden is one of Britain's best kept secrets. This is the very first time its gates have been opened to television cameras. Gresgarth nestles at the bottom of a windswept, steep sided valley, carved out by a crashing beck, and it's acclaimed for achieving the holy grail of great garden design in total harmony with its challenging natural landscape. This is a huge garden. It can be noisy, tumultuous, wet and windy. I'm going to have to get to grips with it in bite-sized pieces. Grasgarth is a private home of Lady Arabella Lennox Boyd and her husband, Sir Mark. Lady Arabella was born and brought up in Italy and she's been designing gardens for more than 45 years, winning six gold medals at the RHS Chelsea Flower Show. I came here and I, I didn't like it at all. I mean, I thought, how am I ever going to make a garden here? I knew that I needed views. I also knew that the landscape was so strong that I couldn't fight against it. I had to go with it and that my garden had to merge into the landscape as naturally as possible. At Gresgarth Hall, Arabella has designed a landscape of complete contrasts, formal on one side and relaxed on the other. To the west of the hall, long herbaceous borders and lawns provide strong architectural elements. On the other side, everything changes. Carving its way through the landscape is a river called the Arkle Beck. Crossing this turbulent torrent rewards us further, leading us on into a wild and wonderful wood. of April at Gresgarth Hall. Despite spring coming late to North Lancashire, this sleeping beauty is waking up and the garden is beginning to sparkle with early gems. Arabella is giving me a tour of the grounds, starting with a wonderful lake that sweeps away from the stone terraces. That lake is just lovely. Was it always like this, though? No, it wasn't. It was like a sort of banana shape. I wanted it to feel as though the water was flooding this little valley. And also, I wanted it to look really natural, and that's why it's very curvy. You're not at all aware of where it comes from. It could just continue off into the landscape. That stone, whilst we were digging for to plant a tree, we came across this huge boulder, which is twice the size, so half of it is underwater. Yeah. And I, I thought, the shape is absolutely perfect, and it, I've got to have it in the lake. And of course, it was near divorce, because Mark was completely, didn't get the point. I saw the disruption it would cause, because we had to get a huge JCB to bring it in. Yeah. Anyway, I got my way, 
and now we're all very, very happy. Yes, I'm sure it. he loves it. He loves it, and it's 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 the lake. It's what it's Greska. The Lennox boys bought Greskarthal in 1979, when it was full of a jumble of self-seeded trees. Over a 40-year period, Arabella has carved out a magical Gothic pleasure garden. I'm intrigued to find out more about how this intrepid gardener, brought up in the warm climate of Italy, set about designing her own garden in this cold northern spot. It must have seemed so elemental. I'm quite elemental myself, and I thought, well, I need to have formality around the house. I need to have some of my Italian straight lines. And so I designed the terraces, which lead down to the level of the river. So we're coming through this hedge, which is the first one I planted to protect the garden from the wind. This was your windbreak. This was my windbreak. And then I thought, how boring. Well, you know, what happens now? So the idea of this green corridor came. I suppose as soon as you come round the corner, you get... You get the view of the lake. What a great idea. And then you come into my circle of grass. This is meant to be a peaceful yeah. place. It's meant to have no flowers at all. And I've got herbaceous borders on that side. These are the elegant formal borders at Gresgarth, set within a sequence of immaculate garden rooms, famous for their kaleidoscopic display of colour. I'll return here in midsummer to see this floral feast, because right now it's the spring walk that's humming the brightest tune. There could not be a better place, a more fitting place to talk about spring at Gresgarth than this. This is the spring walk, and it abounds with wondrous plants that are all just beginning to shoot through the ground. This is Halliborus viridis, meaning green. It's tiny and dainty and very subtle. And this is their time. They're relishing this weather. Bring it on, they say, you know, we're all right. <laughs> and pulmonaris, great fast swathes of them. Totally tough, extremely hardy. And I think that's the thing. This is a northern garden. It's cold. If you're going to live here and flourish, then you've got to be tough. Even in the Lancashire drizzle, this garden is a mouth-watering prospect. But when I come back, it'll be the height of summer. It's then that I'll get the chance to see Gresgarth's strong structure, painted with a riot of floral loveliness. It's just gorgeous. <laughs> I've always wanted to see the legendary gardens at Gresgarth Hall in Lancashire. Now I've been invited to visit it in every season and I'm back to experience its summer glory. I don't think I'm going to be disappointed. It's almost unbelievable the transformation that's occurred since we were last year. We had that cold, wet spring and then suddenly the whole summer got concertinaed into a few weeks. And now everything has burgeoned. Everywhere is smothered, covered in blossom. It's just gorgeous. The whole spirit of the garden has changed. In the spring, there was a challenging feeling, almost a rush to the head. Now everything's softened and relaxed thanks to Arabella's renowned summer planting. Of all the flowers in the gardener's vocabulary, it has to be the rose that epitomises summer best. And here at Gresgarth, roses are in complete control. I wish you could smell the perfume. It just wafts everywhere. And they're growing up the walls, over pergolas. They're absolutely everywhere and they're at their very peak. 
It makes you feel as though you've fallen very softly into the middle of a magical fairy tale. It's easy to assume that this enchanting effect just happened by accident, but far from it. You look at a rose like this, this is gardenia, and it's climbing up these pillars and up the wall. But when you look closer underneath, there are wires there everywhere. Although it looks very romantic, every bit of this rose garden is just a, it's a textbook tribute to the art of pruning and training. And this is all close to the house, close to the sort of cultivated, civilised part of the garden. But when you go out into the broader landscape, that's where Arabella employs these great big scrambling and rambling roses. And it gets less formal the further you go out, the wilder it looks. This level of manicured precision is incredibly labour-intensive. And it's thanks to the skill of head gardener David Sayer and the hard work of his team of gardeners that happy, healthy roses abound. You look lovely in your arbour. Oh, yeah. <laughs> He's an elusive man, but I've caught up with him in Arabella's arbour, which is festooned with Rosa rambling rector on the edge of the back. This is not casual gardening. All Arabella's planting, even in the very wildest areas, is meticulously managed, mapped out and databased in full detail. This is a controlled riot. So are you plotting and planning? Yeah, this is our master plan. Um, we spend a lot of time and effort recording all our yeah. shrubby plants and trees so we know when it came in, who from, when we planted it, so where, when and how, that's what this basically tells you? Absolutely. So where are we now, David? <laughs> We're just here, look. There's, oh. there's the arbour there. Oh, yeah. Um, under the rambling rector. It's outrageously lovely. It's beautiful <laughs> this year. We've had some fabulous weather. All the work months ago, this yeah. is what we were looking for, yeah. and it's doing exactly what it should. When I visited in the spring, David was in the middle of attacking an absolute monster rose on the opposite side of the beck. Or maybe it was the other way round. I can remember when you were pruning that brute. That's Rosa Plendergrass. Yeah. And the main reason why we do all that work is we don't want any dead wood showing while mm. it's in, in full bloom. I know it was you on whom it was inflicted, but it was worth all that blood, sweat and tears because it, it looks divine. It really does. And it emphasises, doesn't it, this change from, you know, the more formal to the semi-wild but still trained and then out into the wilderness. It's very, very natural. It does make it more relaxed. Yeah. And it's into the wilderness that I'm now heading. I'm crossing over to the other side of the beck to explore part of the garden I've yet to step foot in. The wild wood. This is Arabella's Arboretum, where she indulges her great passion for trees. Isn't that just pure poetry? These dainty ornamental trees belong to a family called Cornus, and they're a good choice for a smaller garden because they have lovely year-round interest. In this variety, what looks like the flowers are deep pink. But they're not flowers at all, they're brats, petal-like forms. And the flower itself is here. Lots and little tiny flowers, a cluster. So the whole idea of these big brats that are so bright and vivid is to bring in pollinating insects. It's like waving flags and saying, this way. And in they come into the flower in the centre here. But this is only one collection amongst many. Arabella's cunningly plotted footpaths take us on a journey into the secret depths of the woods. 
Oh, look at this. This is a sort of fairy tree. It's Styrax japonica. Normally Styrax have white flowers, but this has these dainty pink blossoms that just hang down in little bunches. But these are no collections of the usual sort. They're not lined out and numbered and named. The whole point is that they're used beautifully. They all look as though they naturally grew there. This is Arabella's wonderland, and we're invited into it, and we can lose ourselves here. Back in the formal part of the garden, Something very exciting has happened since the spring. The beds and borders at Gresgarth have burst into summer profusion. Arabella is much admired for her incredible herbaceous borders, set within these garden rooms with their structural yew hedges, also designed to shelter the plants within from the fierce westerly winds. And now, at the height of summer, these borders are at their absolute zenith, carefully colour coordinated. Herbaceous perennials, grasses, and bulbs all combine together to create what is everybody's idea of a quintessential English summer garden. How lovely to see you! This is Gresgar's iconic blue garden been longing to see it for years and years. Well, I've been longing to show it to you, and so here we are. The borders were laid out by Arabella to indulge in her passion for plants. Here, one colour shines brighter than all the rest. Why did you choose blue? Why a blue border? I think it's because the, there are a lot of plants that I love which are blue. There's this lovely sort of concentration of purple and blue here. It is good, isn't it? Do you know what I love about that aconite? I like those liney green buds. Yes. They're almost lemon, aren't they? They are, they are. And the blue is as if it had been painted on those yes. individual flowers. I love the solidity of those delphiniums too. And then grass is just coming out over there too. It's lovely. Oh, thank you. This summer has been very unusual, especially up here in North Lancashire because it's just been so hot and dry. Well, it's been unbelievable. It was like being in Italy. We had six weeks of drought and we're going to have more. So the herbaceous have behaved in a completely different way than they usually do. Uh, the Achilles are standing up. The flocks you can hardly see because they, they, they haven't grown because they like it wet. The overall look of the herbaceous ball is looking prettier because it's more delicate than when all the flocks are out. The planning that must go into it is immense. I, I think it's different when I do it for a job, where there everything is very, very, very organised, yeah. and I know exactly what is going in, and I know all the names. When it comes to my borders, it's, it's more like I go to a nursery and I see something wonderful, so I buy it and I plant it. And then you have surprises, like there's a, suddenly there's a crocosmia that's going to flower there. It's against the rules, but yeah. it doesn't matter. I really don't want to be uh, too strict with these borders. No, that's what I love about it too, because yes. you allow plants to be themselves. Well, I try. <laughs> Arabella's blue borders perfectly demonstrate her soft, feminine planting style. She's an artist, painting with flowers, and she doesn't only do blue. Whoa, a whole new place. Well, this is my yellow border, which started off by being the hot border, and then I slowly got rid of the dark oranges. There were a lot of them. Yeah. And I left the yellow and I added a massive amount of blue because yeah. I do find yellow quite difficult, I have but to say. Yellow and blue together, They're a lovely. classic combination, yeah. aren't no, they? No, they look pretty. It looks, it's looking good this year. In a nearby garden room, Symbolic pavements created by local artist Maggie Howarth combine beauty with personal significance. So this is this lovely mosaic, but made from pebbles. 
And isn't this the Gresgarth wind? The Gresgarth weather wind from the west. And on the left we have Leo, which is sun. Yeah. And and that is one of the four signs of the zodiac, which we have in the four corners. The signs of the zodiac represent Arabella's family. So you're Capricorn, but depicted here in mosaic. Yes. I'm a Cancerian, we're opposites. Ah. But <laughs> I think your garden is a, a very personal garden. Couldn't be anybody else's but yours. I, I agree with you, and I think that that's what I try in my work. I, I obviously give myself to the garden I'm designing, but then I always say to my clients that they have to make that garden theirs. Yeah. Because mine is just an idea that I put there for them to use to make it their own garden. On the deepest level, all gardens can be seen as symbolic, a representation of paradise, where nature is harnessed. But here at Gresgarth, in all its heady sensuality, you feel that nature's force lies just under the surface. The strength and structure here, and yet you're constantly aware of Arabella's acknowledgement that it's nature who's truly in control. My summer visit is drawing to a close, but I'm looking forward to seeing what delights the autumn at Gresgarth will present. It's a beautiful October day at Gresgarth Hall in Lancashire. The home and private retreat of acclaimed designer Arabella Lennox Boyd. I've come back to see if this magical garden can match the impact of its summer glory. Just when you think you've seen this garden at its absolute zenith, it astounds you with this kaleidoscopic array of brilliant colours. The trees and shrubs are at their absolute best. And it's at this time of year that you really become aware of Arabella's flair and her huge passion for placing trees and shrubs to make them look as though they'd always been there. There's a lovely example of this just round the corner in the yellow border that I visited with Arabella in the summer. Tucked in behind this meticulously manicured yew hedge is this perfectly placed little Circus. So Circus is the Judas tree. Earlier in the year, it's rich ruby red, but right now it's transformed into its autumn persona. Bronze, orange, russet, the whole thing is just an autumn delight. The great herbaceous borders have also transformed themselves into an autumnal picture. Way back in the summer, these borders, blue borders, were full of flowers, lots and lots of flocks, a real summery affair. But now it's just as colourful, just as exciting. There are grasses all the way through, tall miscanthus with great soft heads. But the most predominant feature of this border is these huge clouds of asters. Michaelmas daisies, most of us would know them as, because it's at Michaelmas during the autumn that these begin to flower. It's shorter day length, which actually prompts their flowering. And what an array of them there are, and these bold, big spikes of nephophia glowing in those autumnal colours. The whole thing is just a glorious celebration of the season. But an intricate border like this doesn't just happen by itself. As Sue Allen, one member of the four-strong gardening team at Gresgarth, knows only too well, 
So how long have you been here, Steve? I'm now in my 16th year here. Yeah. I love the garden. Yeah. It, it's really something quite special, I feel. This really is quite a busy time of year because we've got to take all the tender perennials out of the herbaceous border that we've put in to fill the gaps in the summer and then start cutting back in the garden, ready to put the garden to sleep. I mean, you can't take any chances with tender stuff, can you? Because you're up north. We are indeed, yeah. And we've got to garden really with the weather, yeah. yeah. Come on. <laughs> Sue's invited me to help with a typical autumn task, dividing some of the summer perennials that have now gone over in the borders. It's a way of making more plants, by digging up large clumps and carefully dividing them into smaller pieces, which can then be potted up and grown on for next year, or replanted. Her dogs, Leo and Kipper, are on hand to help. I wonder if that's why she chose border terriers. So in this border, there's loads of flocks, and this is a good time to this is a, them. Yeah, one of the best times to divide them. As you can see, this is quite a massive clump. It's really got quite out of control. First, we dig up the old plant, making sure to get the whole root ball. All right, Carol. It's about time I did a bit of weight lifting. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Thanks, Kipper. Tell you what, you're living dangerously there, dog. Ready, steady. Pushing our forks in back to back like this is a good way to prise the clump apart. I love that wrenching yeah. noise, don't you? When they come apart. And you can see down here, Sue, so look at all these little embryonic buds. They're going to make all natures grow. Yeah. But this time there'll be lots more of them, won't there? Hopefully. But you can see the old woody root stock here. Mm -hmm. And it's that that you want to get rid of, isn't it? It is, so yeah. Invigorate the whole clump. Yeah. Yeah. So we chop out all the dead root stock and old stalks, taking great care not to knock off those juicy young shoots. That's one good new plant, isn't yep. it? And repeat. Look at that. Five bonny clumps, aren't they? All going to make a plant just as big as the one we've taken Hopefully, out. Hopefully, yeah. Now that's what I call proper gardening. Next year, the new plants will be ready for Sue to use in the borders, without her or Kipper having to buy in new plants. The dog's leading the way. Yeah. <laughs> but autumn certainly isn't all about forward thinking for next year. It's very much a time to indulge in its own special qualities, low light, soft colours, and rich fruitfulness. And there's nowhere better to do this than in an area directly opposite the house. Arabella calls it her prairie garden, a place where she experiments with her unique take on prairie planting. That's to say, a mix of flowering perennials and grasses. Watch out, there be lions here. I love this circular bed. And it's made, really, by this grass millennia. Tall, graceful, gorgeous, light, so feathery you feel as though it could almost float away. And that is sort of emphasised by these big spikes of deep blue aconite, strong and sturdy. And each one makes the other one look more so. The garden at Gresgarth is set within 32 acres of agricultural parkland, full of magnificent trees and grazed by sheep. On one boundary, Arabella has created a stunning pleach lime walk, which is a particular treat at this time of year. Isn't it splendid? Look at the colour. I know, it's, it's really looking good and I can't keep away. Pleaching is a way of training trees to produce a narrow screen or hedge. It is a complicated process of tying in and interlacing flexible young shoots along a supporting framework to make walks and tunnels. It's got this big structure 
And yes, it's got this daintiness with those yes. little twigs, hasn't it? I know, isn't it obliging? I mean, if you think of what you do to it every year in the winter, you chop everything off and then yeah. it all comes back with... So that's what happens, everything's pruned right back hard. Yes. Yeah. In February we do it. To all those knobbly bits that's all the right. way along the stems. But the idea of this was to stop the wind, which comes from the west, blowing right. into the garden. And also as a transition between the garden and the park. Yeah. It keeps the view of the park. I never wanted to lose that. No. I didn't want to feel enclosed. I like seeing where I am and feeling where I am. At the end of a pleached walk, Arabella's cunning layout rewards us with a brilliant picture. She's planted this liriodendron, otherwise known as a tulip tree, its leaves aflame to draw us down the walk like an autumn bonfire. Look at that. It's joyous, isn't it? It's wonderful. I think it's the best time of the year. Yeah. No, not quite, but it's, it's one of the best. Especially when you're in the middle of especially, it. <laughs> especially when it's good, like this. I mean, I've never seen this amazing colour on, on these liriodendrons. I'm glad I planted them. Yeah, so am I. <laughs> <laughs> and if there's one thing you can count on Arabella doing, that'll be planting trees. Across the bridge in the 15-acre wood, Arabella has created a natural but carefully curated arboretum. How many trees have you planted? I'm about 6,000, certainly. And, and increasing all the time. And increasing all the time, yes, I can't stop. But the real skill has been making this woodland appear as if it's been here for a hundred years. It looks so totally in tune with nature. Well, it's, I think it's because of the wonderful trees, that the, the oaks that were there, yeah. and, and the large trees which I've decided to keep. Yeah. So I decided to keep a matrix of old trees yeah and then to uh, open up the rest. Because the, there it's backbone. To the Absolutely, because you need the shade, but you also need the height and all, you need the history. Yeah. And you need the, the wood to feel natural, even though it's completely unnatural, really, because I've planted this big collection of trees, which is my passion. Although Arabella has room for many trees, she only chooses specimens that give good value all year round, including blossom, fruit, berries or seeds, and attractively coloured bark or autumn leaves. And we can all learn from that practice. These two little corners, we saw them in the summer, and they were covered, smothered in brats. But now, all you notice about them is this glorious autumn colour. And that one's smothered in berries. Yes, it is. And they're delicious to eat. Oh, are they? Yes, well, <laughs> except you do, there are a lot of seed in yeah, them. But, um, <laughs> yes, but, but it's, the flesh is sweet. Yeah, and I bet you sow the seeds, don't yes, you? Yes, absolutely, if I can. In the middle of the wood is a collection of dazzling white silver birches. These Betula utilis Jack Montii surround an intriguing feature handmade by Arabella's husband, Sir Mark. Here in the woods, he's let his imagination run wild. So, <laughs> suddenly in the circle of birch, you come across this singular construction. <laughs> well, you see the water dribbling down. It comes from the top of the hill. There's a big drain way up there. Yes. And so you've got a pipe. It's well, 100 yards long, I suppose, but because it's so much higher, when it comes here, it can go up to the top of that easily. And so then it's it gathering down. momentum all the way down, and I then think so. up it shoots. It it's enough. made of tufa, which you know better than me, is a limestone. As you see, the moss is gradually moving up it. And the skirt of heart's tongue ferns is really, isn't Well, it's it been a success. Perfect. There's no doubt that it's caused a lot of pleasure. I mean, this is all Arabella's idea, the, the birch trees. Yeah. And I think, you know, I, I, I've always understood her to think it was rather magical, and I did, and so that's why I thought this would be a nice thing in the middle. And it, it, it hasn't needed an awful lot of maintaining. Well, there's always water around here, and isn't there? And there's a lot of water <laughs> in Lancashire. 
and there's a lot of soul in this part of the garden. Perhaps there always was, and it's been Arabella's mission to bring that out. You've never lost this sort of fairy tale feel to this because it is a magical valley, isn't it? Because I was born in the countryside, this is where I relate. I love um, my collections and and I love the woods and the water and the sound of the water and and the garden is 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 a decoration and it's yeah. you know the public like it and yes. but uh but you uh, love it in here don't you I do yeah. I do I love it I do too yes <laughs> and I've loved my autumn visit to Grasgarth when I return in the winter Lots of plants will have died down, hibernating, waiting for the spring. But what you'll really be able to appreciate is the structure, the skeleton, the real bones of the garden. I'm back for my final visit to Arabella Lennox Boy's magical garden at Gresgarth Hall. It's winter. Early flowering trees and shrubs are awakening from dormancy. The camellias hold out their tight buds, just waiting for the merest hint of sun. You might assume that for a person with Arabella's Italian descent, Winter in a cold northern garden might be a bit much, but not a bit of it. Arabella has come to understand it. Not only that, she embraces it. She moves it forward. She loves her garden in a British winter. Arabella knows only too well that a garden should be a feast for all the senses. I've admired splendid sights in every season here, but now one of the real surprises comes from perfect perfume that wraps around the terrace. There's one aspect of winter gardens that's very often neglected, and it shouldn't be. It's scent. This lovely little shrub, Sarka Cocker, has tiny, tiny little flowers but the aroma from those flowers is just beautiful. And the scent pervades the air. Wherever you walk, you can smell it. There's a whole host of other things too. And Arabella's planted them in vast arrays around the place because she says she wants, wherever you walk, in the winter, to experience this beautiful perfume. Whether you're drinking in the scent in the formal garden near the house, or strolling through the wild woods, the perfume of scented shrubs pervades the air, stopping you in your tracks. Walking through here could, could not evoke winter anymore. There's the sound of the beck rushing by, and everywhere you're surrounded by these russets. But suddenly, you're stopped in your traps by this burst of colour. These beautiful cones of sparkling flowers. The witch hazels, hamamelis. There's this sharp, spicy fragrance and it carries on the air right through the wood. And if you look at them individually, each flower, it's just something space age. These slender, slender petals which wave around, attracting insects, bringing them in. The essence of winter, but the promise of spring. This woodland brilliantly demonstrates Arabella's ability to add a light but perfect touch to the more natural areas. But at this time of year, she also knows how to seduce you with a sight that most clearly signals winter. As you come down, you can just see the sea of white. I mean, everybody likes snowdrops, don't they? Well, it's the first flower that really gives you proper satisfaction in, in January. 
you just know that um, spring's on its way and nothing's Absolutely. going to stop it. Absolutely. And then there is the markings that you start looking at yeah. when you become obsessed by them. Yes. And uh, you also realise that you have to literally lie on the floor to see, to see what them. they're like. Or oh, sort of bend down right down. But still. It's... So they're, they're not only beautiful, but they provide great exercise. They do provide great <laughs> exercise, yes. Snowdrops also take kindly to being moved from one spot to another. When they've finished flowering, dig up the bulbs and replant, and you'll be rewarded with even more of them the following year. I love this little corner. It's, it's sort of secluded almost, isn't it, and private. These borders here, I call them the early spring borders. Exciting to see the hellebores just coming out. It's absolutely wonderful for this time of the year. What's so lovely about this planting is that everything's growing the kind of place it would in the wild yes. if it were a wild plant. Because this is what hellebores love, isn't it? Well, they like this leaf mould, which I put on every year, yeah. and a slight dapple shade. Uh, I just think that there's such good value for this time of the year. <laughs> the winter because I love to see structures and now you see these lovely box balls and and uh, and architecture whilst in the summer there is so much going on particularly in this garden I think because I can't stop buying plants so <laughs> I you know I'm filling the borders with everything I like so winter is simplicity and freshness and just being able to see everything yes and and having views and everything being open. No colour, I just want green. I think any time's <laughs> the right time in your garden. Yeah, well, thank you. <laughs> My time here is nearly over. What a year it's been. From the exquisite splashes of colour in the late spring to the soft opulence of summer and from the rich colours, juicy berries and golden grasses of one of Britain's best ever autumns to the misty subtleties of a Lancashire winter's day. This garden really is a tonic year round. I'd never visited Grousegarth before this year, but I'd heard all about it and always with high praise. But the reality far exceeds all those opinions about it. Arabella's got a strong personality. And yet you feel that here, rather than her imposing her will on the garden, it's the garden that's played the tune. She honors the place, she respects every inch of it, and it shows everywhere. And that's what makes Grasgarth one of Britain's great gardens. <laughs>